Hello everybody, it's Gary Hall Sr. at the Race Club in Coronado. Beautiful day in Coronado. On our live broadcast on YouTube, I want to thank our producer, Thomas Henson, our new coach at the Race Club here with me. He has put together a great program today. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Um, hopefully uh, you'll continue to watch our live programs throughout the Olympic Games. We're going to be on every two days uh, recapping the events that have already occurred and also previewing those events that are coming up. Uh, before we dive into a recap, we have a lot of events today, a lot of great races in this Olympic Games. Uh, just, it's, it's been an incredible game so far. Um, in some respects, a little hard to predict. There have been some amazing surprises, people that we hadn't even counted on or thought about that have, have meddled or won. Uh, there have also been some disappointments, people that we expected to do well and that didn't. Uh, before we get into our recap, starting with the women's 200 free, though, I wanted to uh, just remind you that we have produced, thanks to my son Richard, a ton of, of great videos that are free, that are available on YouTube. Uh, I hope that you've watched some of them, maybe all of them, and you appreciate how good the content is that Richard produces. He uses 4K, uh, or uh, uh, Red Epic 8K resolution cameras. Uh, highest quality cameras available for video. Uh, we go to the expense of getting sound guys and, and jibs and everything brought in to make shots that you probably will never see in any other kind of production. But there's a cost to all that. And by becoming a member, by joining the, as an elite member of the race club, just hit the join button at the top of the screen on the front page of the home page of the race club YouTube channel. Uh, you will help us out and help us so we can continue to produce this great content for you. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's jump in. Don't forget, throughout this program, you can ask questions, make comments. Um, I'm gonna give you my opinion. I wanna hear from you too. I wanna know what your opinion is. A lot of what we talk about in the recaps is not just who won, what their splits were. It's more than that. We like to talk about their technique, and um, that's important to us. And the little things, the things that you may not pick up that make a difference in why these people are so good. So in the women's swimmer free, Ariane Titmus did not disappoint. She, she ended up swimming the race we expected her to, uh, winning in 153.5, and just a beautifully swum race. I wanna, and she's a, she's a, uh, a shoulder-driven freestyler with an unusual breathing pattern in that she really goes 4-1 uh, four all the way through the 200, uh, four strokes, she's breathing every uh, two cycles rather than every cycle, which a lot of the athletes are. There's some that go for two, going four cycles without a, or four strokes without a breath, and then breathing two cycles in a row. But Ariane is uh, breathing every fourth stroke all the way through. And coaches will often teach, as I do in the 200s, to try to make the second, third, and fourth splits of a 200 equal. And Ariane did exactly that to the tenth of a second. On her second 50, she splits 28.8. On her third 50, she splits 28.8. On her fourth 50, she splits 28.8. She's like a machine, and she's staying right around 100 stroke rate all the way through, maybe a tad under at times, but she gets a little faster when she holds those four breaths, uh, four strokes without a breath, and she slows a little bit for two breaths, and she goes faster. But what an amazing swim. What an amazing athlete. Hats, hats off to Dean uh, Boxel, who coached her for really training her to be able to do that and do it well. You're not you're, you're going to see that type of pacing not just from Ariane, but throughout tonight in all four of the strokes, and it's no different in the fly, in the back, in the breaststroke. We like to see uh, 50 splits at the second, third, and fourth 50s of the 200, all about the same time. Uh, uh, Shobin uh, Howie finishes second. Chauvin swims for my good friend and, and respected coach, Mike Bottom, University of Michigan. Uh, I truthfully didn't expect, I know Chauvin's a great swimmer, I didn't expect her to be as fast as she did. I did not, um, I did not predict her to get second in this race, but I, I'm really glad she did. She's playing a, a beautiful race at 153.9, and her splits were 55-1, 55-88, uh, or, or 58-8, she was 28-3, 29-0, 29-8, and that's indicative of a more typical kind of, of, uh, of, of pacing. So we didn't see that with, Sh or with uh, Ariane. We saw even splitting, and that you know, ability to come home in 57-6 is what made the difference. 
So Penny Alexiak takes third. Using uh, the first two are shoulder driven freestylers, and Penny's a hybrid freestyler um, with a long stroke. Her stroke rate is more in the 84 range at the beginning, and she drops down to 80 on her third 50, uh, finishing at 84. But she uh, went 154.7, she was out in 55.3, back in 59.4. Again, not able to hold, sustain that kind of pace that Ariane had 28.9. 29.5, 29.7 on the last 350s. Uh, again, a great swim for Ariane. She, she um, obviously, um, you know, went out to win that, swam a very smart race. Uh, one word about Katie, and she was expected to be in there. We expected her to be in. She just didn't swim her race, and the only race strategy she really knows is to go out for it. She just didn't do it. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, the, the with the 800 or the 1500 coming up was on her mind, but she just didn't swim uh, Katie's kind of race. So she kind of held back, and she just doesn't have the closing speed to be able to finish that way. Um, and we went to the men's 200 fly, where, as expected, it was the Krista Milak show. And, I mean, you're never going to see a more beautiful flyer, and I'm including Michael Phelps in that comment, because Kristoff has more distance per stroke than anyone out there. Um, he goes out and, and what I think was actually the easiest looking 53 48 I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he actually looks like he's just taking a bath and he's going so fast. His upper body strength is amazing. He's got a strong kick. Uh, he goes out 53 4 and back in, in 57 7. Again, look at his second, third, and fourth 50s. And it's probably harder to maintain those 50s at the same time in fly than in any other stroke. Very few can do it. But Christophe goes 29 flat on the second 50, 28 7 on the third 50. And that, to me, was kind of the, the, the break the back 50. He just pulls away from everyone and then finishes with a 29 1. Um, I, I just want to make one comment. And, and hats off to also to uh, Timura Honda, who was second, who went a, a really a lifetime best, 153 7 to get the silver medal. It uh, looked like he was coming on like gangbusters at the end. It was really relative to everybody else just slowing down. Because Tamora, in his second, third, and, and fourth 50 splits were 28.9, 29.5, and then 29.8. So he's slowing down. He's just not slowing down as much as the others. But for Kristoff to hold those 350s equal is just unstoppable. Now, I thought he might break 150. As the look on his face as he finished that race, I think he thought he might too. And he was very disappointed. It reminded me a little bit, I'm going to take you back a few years to 1984 when there was a backstroker in the United States named Rick Carey. Rick was from um, Badgerson Club in New York, swam for Eddie Reese at Texas. Great backstroker, the best in the world. In the semifinals of the 200 back, after he predicted he'd break a world record in the finals. So he goes in the finals in L.A., and I've got my 10-year-old son next to me, Gary Hall Jr., and we're watching Rick Carries from the 200 back, and Rick wins the gold medal, but he misses the world record by a second. He didn't even swim as fast as he did in the, in the semifinals. And from that moment on, all the way up onto the award stand and walking around the pool, the parade around the pool after the, after the ceremony, he hangdogged it like he had a bad day at the office. And my son, Gary, looked over to me and says, Dad, didn't he just win the gold medal? And I said, yeah, he did. And he said, why isn't he smiling? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know. And when you look at Kristov as he comes in, he was disappointed with his time. But dang it, this is the Olympic Games. You know, it's about racing. One of the things I love about Gary Jr., he, he couldn't tell you his times from any Olympic Games, any relay, any world record. He doesn't remember. He was always racing. And that's what this is about. So when Kristoff comes in, you look at the video, he just like looks like, oh, man, it was a bad swim. Well, 151.2 is not a bad swim, uh, probably the second fastest time ever, and he won the gold medal. Hats off also to Federico Berdusso, who got the, the bronze medal from Italy, uh, you know, 154.4. He just, you know, he went out fast, just couldn't hold on. Look at his splits at 28.4, 29.6, 31.3. And that's kind of more, you know, typical of what we see in the fly, where it's just really hard to keep that pace going. So then we went to the, the women's 200 IM finals, and uh, wow, what a race this was. Um, I got the f first three predictions right. I just didn't get the order right. 
I really thought Kate would win this, and unfortunately her backstroke split at 33.9 compared to the other girls. Second and a half slower just unfortunately is too much to give up. I am going to point out, because I'm a big fan of stroke rate in the backstroke, you know, her stroke rate at 71 is just not enough to do the trick. And if she can get, if, Al, if Kay would be able to get an 80s in her stroke rate on the backstroke, you know, she'd cut a second off that split. Now, maybe she wouldn't be, she had the fastest breaststroke split out there, uh, but the backstroke is just, you know, what cost her the middle. I thought she'd come back in that free. She, they all came back. Um, Yui Ohashi came back in 30.7 to win. Alex um, held on strong, way better than in the trials. I thought, give her credit for that. She almost had it. In fact, it was five strokes into the wall, and she just lost a little bit of that edge, or she had the gold medal in her pocket. Uh, she comes back in 30.9, almost the same, but just the last few strokes. If she'd been able to come in fast, she would have had it. She didn't. She loses by a tenth of a second. And then Kate goes to a nine flat, also finishing in 30.8. So all the three girls finished almost at the same time. Uh, great swim for uh, Yui, both gold medals in the IMs. She's established herself as the queen of the IM in the world. And then we had the women's 1500 freestyle. Uh, I guess the only surprise there was how well Erica Sullivan came back in that race. And uh, really hats off to her. I thought Katie would go a little faster than that. I mean, she takes out her first 50 at 100 stroke rate, and then she settles into an 86 stroke rate for a while. It drops down to about an 82 stroke rate with her hybrid freestyle all the way through. Nobody's strong enough to catch her, and, and that's basically the way she swims the best, is getting out in front and daring everybody to try to come catch her. Uh, they couldn't, but Erica made a valiant finish at the end. Her 100 plus stroke rate all the way through, two-beat kick, a little reminiscent of the three decades of women dominance in, in distance freestyle with what I call the, the 200-plus club, two-beat kick, 100-stroke rate or more, going all the way back to Shirley Babishoff, Shane Gould, uh, Brooke Bennett, and Janet Evans. They were all 100-stroke rate all the way through the 1500. Uh, but Erica was valent. The only thing I want to mention about her technique was she's high-octane with very horizontal recovery trajectory. And you've heard me talk about vertical recovery and how important that is. Uh, but Eric would not win a 50 or 100 or a 200 because she doesn't use her body rotation very much. What she does rely on is higher octane, which means more energy in the arm coming around straight, but less shoulder rotation and a high stroke rate. She doesn't go fast without a high stroke rate. She is a girl that has to have that. She doesn't have the, she has the two beat kick going. They all do pretty much. Um, but she really came back and, and great training, uh, just great job, Ron, um, I'm blanking on Ron's last name up in um, at Sandpiper. Um, it'll come to me in a second, but he's, he's done a great job with those girls. In fact, uh, this morning, Katie Grimes had an awesome 800, and she'll be in there fighting for a medal uh, in that race tonight. So Sarah Kohler from Germany was third, 1542. And the Chinese girl that I thought uh, might medal, or I had predicted her to medal, was 1546, John Chiang Wang. Um, anyway, so that was a, a good, and I was just happy for Katie to get that gold medal. She deserved it. She's dominated that race, and, and she needed to win that. Now the men's 800 free relay, and another race, uh, no surprise on the winner. We had predicted Great Britain would win that. Uh, you know, there just didn't seem like any way they couldn't. The only question was, would they break the world record? Uh, Tom Dean, a little bit of a disappointment leading off 145.7 when he went 144.5, I believe, or about a second faster in his race. If he goes anywhere close to that time on a leadoff like they have the world record. Uh, James Guy throws down a 144.4. Matthew Richards really came back in the second 100, 145 flat. And Duncan Scott finishes with a blazing 143.4. Um, Russia was second. I, I didn't see them coming in there and meddling, but they did a great job. Kudos to them. They were 145, very consistent on all four of their legs. And then Australia, who was only, I think, three one hundredths of a second behind Russia, ended up third. And I want to, hats off to Thomas Neal, who anchored their relay in a 144.7, but I want to throw in that uh, Kyle Chalmers swam the second leg on that at 145.3. Now, maybe, just maybe, and people were arguing, you know, that Caleb should have been in the 
in the 800 free relay for the United States, and we would have gotten a silver medal and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that 145.3 could have taken a little bit out. Just all he needed was six one hundredths of a second to win the 100 freestyle. Maybe that was enough to take that, that, that extra little bit of energy from Kyle Chalmers, and it maybe gave uh, uh, Caleb the gold medal in the 100. We'll never know. Uh, but the USA was fourth, and I want to shout out to, to Kieran Smith, who had a, really a fantastic leadoff leg at 144.7, uh, got the U.S. off to a great start, um, and K Drew Kibler kept it going. Uh, and now Zach Apple. And I, I'm going to defend Zach here because it's easy to be an armchair quarterback. It's easy to say, well, gosh, why didn't they put Caleb? Why didn't they put uh, you know, Blake Peroni on there? They had two guys that could have, you know, probably gone to 145 or maybe low 146 and we would have been a silver. Well, guess what? Nobody, none of those coaches, Zach didn't know he was going to go 147. And some days you just don't feel well. He had a bad swim. I know that morning in the 100, didn't make the finals. And that had to hurt him mentally. Uh, but I'm not going to second guess. Those are tough decisions to make. Zach goes 146, I believe, at the trials. Everybody thinks he's going to go 145. He just didn't have it, and, and it, was, it was painful to watch his last 50. Uh, but he's a great guy. Don't give him a hard time. Don't give the coaches a hard time. You can't win them all. They have to make some tough decisions. I just want to tell you, Townley Haas, who has not had a good meet, ends with a 144.8, and hats off to him. He's, he toughed that out, man. He, he swam a heroic finish in that, and he almost got him back into the middle. Uh, stand, but he didn't quite make it. All right, and then we go on to the 800 free, maybe the, the, the race of the entire meet. I was just so excited. I was screaming. I was hollering. I was yelling. I had goosebumps on the entire last 50. My wife didn't think, and I, in, in her defense, she doesn't follow the way I did, but she didn't think there was any way he could catch those guys when you're body length behind with 50 meters to go. You just don't think there's enough you know, fuel left in the tank to get home. But this guy, this race, first of all, let me take you back a few years. This race was reminiscent of the 1976 1,500-meter freestyle Montreal where you had Bobby Hackett, uh, Brian Goodell, and Stephen Holland from, from Australia go stroke for stroke for 1,500 meters without maybe more than a half a body length separation with all three of them. And it came down to the last 50. It had the entire stands on their feet for at least the last 800 of that race. So this was one of those races where any one of five, got four guys could have won. And, and it was Bobby Fink, Gregorio Paltrinieri in the outside lane, uh, Michaela Romanchuk from the Ukraine and Florian Wall Brock from Germany, all going at it through the whole thing. And of course, Gregorio has one strategy, just like Mike Burton did back in the day. He's got to go out fast. He's really kind of a one pace guy and he's a fast stroker, 96 stroke rate hybrid freestyler, one down kick out of each stroke cycle, and that comes right after the breath stroke with the right arm coming in. Pulls way under his body. If I, I, I don't know how this guy does, goes as fast as he does when his left hand, when he pulls under his body the way he does, but he goes fast, and he's just like a machine. Every stroke, every 50 was like within a half a second of each other. But Bobby makes that turn, and Bobby's a hybrid, all, and Gregor, or uh, uh, Michaela's a hybrid swimmer. Uh, Florian is a hip-driven guy who's like a barge out there. Reminds me of Ian Thorpe a little bit. He's got his head really high. He's plowing through, and he's got an amazing kick. Uh, but he doesn't have the speed at the end to, to bring it home. Um, Romanchuk, I wasn't sure. I thought Romanchuk had this race. I really did, until Bobby started, comes off the last 50. And he kicks it in in the last 50 like I haven't seen since Sun Yang, who could have finished, I think, at 1,500 and once in 25-9. So Bobby finishes in 26-3, 54-9 on the last 100. What a, what a finish. I'm just an amazing kid. Great swim. Hats off to um, uh, University of Florida and Anthony Nesty, his coach. The whole, whole coaching staff down there did a great job getting this guy ready to win an event that I don't think – uh, too many people thought he would win. So uh, Bobby was an outstanding swim. Fun to watch that one. All right, then we have, what's next? We got the... Uh, the men's two breasts. The men's 200 breaststroke. Let me find my notes here. Uh, here we go. So 
Wow, what a great race. Um, I'm going to go back to, you know, this, this uh, goal of coaches, of all of us coaches trying to get our swimmers to split evenly on the second, third, and fourth 50s, and that's exactly what Isaac Stubbley Cook did. Uh, hats off to him. 206.38 wasn't close. He, he earned the gold medal. He splits 101.7, second 50, 32.3, third 50, 32.4, Fourth 50, 32, 2. Textbook, exactly like Ariane, exactly the way you'd want to see a split. Uh, gets his stroke rate up. He winds it up just like a lot of the breasters do it on the stroke rate. Ends up with a very fast stroke rate. Doesn't even look like he's in contention at the 50, but he finishes so strong. He's not quite as extreme as Anton Chipkov in terms of building it up, but that's exactly what he did. Paced it right and, and almost breaks the world record, 206.3. Arno Kaminga was second, 207.1. Uh, Arno is a different type of swimmer. He tends to go out a little fast. He's got more speed than the other guys, and he tries to hang on. Just can't do it. He doesn't quite have the uh, ability to, to beat Isaac in the last 50. And uh, he ends up at 207.01. And just behind him was Matty Matson from Finland. Uh, great swim for Matty. It's 207.1. Anton Chupkov gets fourth at 207.2. And, and Nick from the U.S. was fifth at 207.9. But great pacing for uh, Isaac Stubbley Cook from Australia. Great swim. Uh, almost got the world record. Would have been nice to see that, but he, he didn't quite make it. Uh, women's 200 fly. Uh, this one belonged to, to Yufei Zhang. And, and Yufei, you know, proved herself in the fly in the 100, uh, narrowly missing out uh, to Maggie McNeil. But swims an amazing 203. 86, uh, one of the fastest times we've seen in recent years. By the way, that 200 meter world record, I don't know when that one's gonna get broken, if ever. That one done during the, uh, the, the slick suit days in 2008 or nine, uh, 201 is, is crazy fast. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to Reagan Smith because Reagan, along the lines of what I'm talking about, swam a really smart race. I thought Haley was gonna give uh, Yufi a, a run for her money, but she really didn't have that kind of talent to go 203. Both Reagan and Haley swam great races, don't get me wrong. But Reagan swam the smartest race of her Olympic racing uh, uh, curriculum, or her, her, her races, of all of them, this was her best race. Again, looking at her second, third, and, and fourth 50s, 32-3, 32-8, 1 and that's what enabled her to do it. She doesn't characteristically swim it that way. She usually goes out fast, but she held back. And it, and it ended up probably giving her the silver instead of the bronze medal. Uh, she finished at 205.3, Haley Flickinger, 205.6. Um, great race, great job for the US getting second, third. Uh, outstanding swim by Yu Um Three different recoveries on there too, I wanna to mention as long as I'm doing that. Reagan is very, uh, vertical on a recovery. Haley is a little bit more verti also vertical, but has a little bit of a ascending trajectory. And Yufeng, Yufai uh, is more of a traditional horizontal recovery. So you'll see three different techniques being used by those three women. All right, then we go to the men's 100 freestyle. Oh my gosh, what a race. Um, a lot of you watched the 100 freestyle in, um, oops. A lot of you watched the 100 freestyle in, uh, uh, in, in Korea at the World Championships. Sorry about that, I hit the up button. And um, hell, this was a replay of that. It really wasn't, in a way, it was, it was quite a different race and a different strategy that Caleb used on this race. Uh, we know he's gonna be a half a body length ahead of the field. And those are all great starters, by the way. Uh, when he, he, he breaks out, um, Chalmers is about at his waist. So Caleb goes out in 22.39, but he swam this differently. In Korea, he was actually 22.1 or 22.2. He's almost two tenths of a second faster than he was here. Now he comes out of the, this 100 freestyle, out of this um, start with his guns blazing. I mean, he was 115 stroke rate in the first 15 meters. Then he settled into 105, which was faster stroke rate than he held in Korea, where he was kind of a 98 to 100 stroke rate all the way down. And then he accelerated into the wall with 105 stroke rate and came out at 105 stroke rate. Well, he comes out of the turn here 
uh, if you look, it comes out at a 98 stroke rate. So he has great underwaters, but he comes up and he tones it down. And he actually slows down to, you know, he's about around 100, but he comes out and then he slows down to around 98. And everybody's catching him. And they're catching him. And you think, oh my gosh, is Kyle Chalmers going to do it again? Is he going to come back and win that gold medal like he did five years ago in Rio? But with 15 meters to go, and I've never seen, I, I've never seen uh, Caleb go into this kind of stroke rate. He actually went to 125 stroke rate on the last 15 meters, two meters earlier than he did in Korea. He also doesn't take a breath. Get this, last 13 strokes into the wall, no breath. How do you do that? How do you do that? He's amazing. Now, is he hurting at that point? You bet he is. Is he starting to slow down? Well, he is all the way to that 15 meter mark, and then he holds his speed because his stroke rate goes up. So Chalmers, who's like Steady Eddie, he's like Mr. Machine, he's 105 stroke, date, stroke rate down. By the way, he makes the turn at 22.7, which is a tenth of a second faster than he was at the World Championships. He set himself up to win because all he needs is a tenth of a second, and he's got the gold. He comes back a little slower than he did in Korea. He comes back in 24.37. Don't get me wrong. Still super fast. But I think the difference is, and you can look, go back to YouTube and watch this race. In the last 10 meters, Kyle Chalmers slows from 105 to a 98 stroke rate. Didn't do that in Korea. He slows the stroke rate down and probably tired. I'm sure he is exhausted. But then he breathes. He holds for four strokes when he's like eight meters from the wall. And he breathes every cycle all the way into the wall. I think if he holds that breath like Caleb and he puts his head down and he doesn't lift his head, he does lift his head at the end of this race. And that could have cost him, that alone could have cost him, he wins the gold medal. Instead, he's 47.08, Caleb's 47.02, and Caleb has the gold medal. Uh, kudos to Caleb for hanging in there. Those last 13 strokes without a breath, that's gold, baby, right there. It reminds me of a little bit of, of Nathan in London where Nathan snatched the gold medal back from James Magnuson. James Magnuson was ahead of him with 10 meters to go, and, and eight strokes into the wall, Nathan puts his head down, no breath, high octane into the wall, and takes the gold medal back. But this was that kind of race. I thought Chalmers had it. No, Caleb was not going to be denied. Um, Kolesnikov, third, 47-4. He's out in 22-49. He was just eating Caleb's waves on the way back. Tough position to be in. And uh, he finishes, his, he's a hybrid freestyler, but he, he goes, he's, he's averaging 105. So he's 100 on one side, if you measured 110 on the other, he's at about 105 stroke rate all the way down. Fast stroke rate guy, back stroke two. And he actually ends the last 10 meters, 110 stroke rate, but he's just hurting at the end. He can't finish like he did in the prelims or in the semifinals where he went 47-1. And then the women's 800 free relay. Um, this just goes to show you never know. You just never know what's going to happen because everybody had predicted Australia would win this race. Now, in defense of them, all three countries were under the world record. So that's pretty rare that you see three countries go under a world record in one race. Uh, but they just didn't get the production out of the first two legs. They put uh, Ariane first, expecting to have a big lead. She was over a second, I think, slower then she let off her, then her individual race. And then they, they put uh, Emma McCown second, who I think they would have expected her to be in the 154 somewhere, and she was in the one, low 155s. Not bad swims by any means, but they didn't get the clear water. They didn't get the separation that they wanted. As a result, uh, China swims very evenly through all their legs at 155s and, and, and wins it. Um, the U.S. hats off to Katie, who anchors in a 153.7, uh, and, you know, just toughs that out. I mean, her stroke rate, like 120, crazy fast, starting out. But she just says, I'm not going to slow down. I'm not going to die. I am going to chase these girls down. And she came really close to doing it, just a half a second off China, beats the Australian, uh, a, a marvelous swim. And in, a, in a meet where she's not necessarily having the best meet of her life, she just pulled that one uh, I think out of the very toughness pile. She just really swam great there. Uh, also kudos to Paige Madden who won a 155.2 and Katie McLaughlin who won 155.3. Those two legs in the middle saved the US and, and great swims by those two girls. Uh, not a bad lead off 
for Allison Schmidt either at 156.3. So the U.S. team swam o over their heads. Australia swam under their potential, and China takes the gold medal. All right. We're on to women's 200 breaststroke. Now, these are the, the previews of what you're going to see tonight. And, uh, gosh, uh, hats off to Tatiana Schoenmaker, who's having an amazing um, Olympics. Um, you know, I've been talking about second, third, and fourth 50s with all four strokes, freestyle. I haven't gotten to backstroke yet. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but on the fly, you had uh, Milok going even split. On the freestyle, you had Aryan exactly the same splits on, on two, three, and four. So Tatiana on, on her second, third, and fourth 50s, 35-6, 30, uh, 37, 36 flat. All she needs to do, and this is a tall order. This is easier said than done. All she needs to do is go 35-7. If she can finish a little faster, she's got the world record and the gold medal. Um, she's out. And, and this is a... There's some unusual things about her stroke that I want to point out that I, I love about her stroke and I think make her uh, really exceptional in a breaststroke. And it's different than most swimmers do. And, and, and you'll look, go back and look at these things because these are really important. First of all, stroke rate-wise, you don't, like, unlike Milak, who's trying to hold the stroke rate the same through the fly, and he does. He's like 48 stroke rate all the way through. Breaststroke, you can't hold the same stroke rate without slowing down because your legs fatigue. It's a fatiguing stroke. There's no rest time. There's no vacation time in breaststroke. So they have to increase their stroke rate. I call it winding up, and that's exactly what she does. She's about a 36 stroke rate on her first 50, and this is the semifinals, and then 32 on the second 50. She slows it down a little bit, and then she goes to 39 on the third 50 and 47 stroke rate on the last 50. Um, but watch her swim. There's two things I want you to pay attention to in Tatiana's breaststroke. She holds her head down longer than any other breaststroker in the field. And because of that, she gets this extraordinary um, surge out of her pull. Her pull is wider than the other swimmers, which I like. I think it's great. And she keeps that chin down on her chest longer than anybody in that low drag position. Her head is underwater longer than anybody else. And that's what enables her to get that power out of her pole. Her kick is great. She's coming up high and she's coming back down. But look how long she keeps that head down, which I think is really what makes her exceptional. They all have great legs. They all have, you know, most of them are all swimming. Unlike um, uh, Lydia Jacoby, they're all swimming, elevating, snapping the head down. But what, what I think um, Tatiana does different is she keeps her chin on her chest longer and then pulls wider than the other girls. In fact, if I had to, it's hard to be critical of a woman who holds the world record in the, in the 100 breaststroke, but if I had to be, I've noticed a difference in Lily King's breaststroke. She doesn't pull as wide as she do, used to, and she doesn't hold the head down as long as she used to. I think those two things have hurt her, her technique. Now, uh, Evangelina Ch uh, Chikunova from Russia, um, I predict tonight um, that, that Tatiana is gonna win the event I think she breaks the world record. She's going to be right around 219 flat, 219.1. It would be great to see her go under it. I think that would be an amazing soon. She, she earned it. She's almost broken it twice. Uh, Chikunova second from Russia, I believe, 219.7. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw Annie Laser in for the, for the bronze medal. God love her. Uh, had a big tragic event with her father passing away, and we're all pulling for you, Annie. 220.9, that's what I've got you down for. Swim a smart race, you always do. Don't get too far behind at the beginning, but just really come home like gangbusters in that last 50, and let's see if you can't get under 221. Um, Lily, just a comparison, because she swims at a race more reminiscent of Rebecca Sony. Rebecca and Lennon was 42-42, uh, 46-46 on her stroke rate, and, and pretty much even split it, and, and Lily, uh, whose splits were also fairly even. They just weren't as fast. She was 36-5, 37 flat, 37 flat. But she's 38 stroke rate, 38 stroke rate, 40 stroke rate, 40 stroke rate. So she's staying pretty much even Steven through the whole thing. That's a different way of swimming this race. And that's more to Lily's, um, you know, her, her style and her physiology. And I think she has to swim it like that. So did Rebecca. But I just don't think 
uh, Lily has the, the physiology to be able to, to go at 220 or better in that 200. So uh, I think she's, I don't know, fourth, fifth, something like that. Uh, men's 200 backstroke. Um, this, this uh, I think, could be a really great race, and I think it's going to boil down uh, to two guys. Uh, Evgeny Ryloff, who, who already proved himself in the 100. Uh, what's amazing about Ryloff is, you know, he, he goes 153. Or what did he go in the prelims? 154.4. Looked like he was taking a bath. He's a 71 stroke rate. And so, you know, all of you have listened to me a while, and I keep telling you the three most important things in, in backstroke is stroke rate, stroke rate, stroke rate. Well, Ryloff wins 100 in 51.9 with an 81 stroke rate, and he goes 154 in the 200 with a, with a 71 stroke rate. And what's up with this? How can he do that? Well, the guy's got a kick to beat the band. And I, you won't see many people underwater beating Ryan Murphy, but. Um, Ryloff has it as, as good or better underwaters than, 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 than Ryan. And, I, you know, I think the way Ryan has to win this race is he's got to go from the 71 to 75 stroke rate he had in the, in the semifinals up to an 80 plus, 81, 82 stroke rate and try to hold that and hope that he can, you know, get the finish because it could boil down to the last 5, 10 meters. I think it's going to be a great race. I predict. Ryloff gets him, but it's, you know, I'd love to see Murph get it. 153.3 and 153.5, somewhere in that range. Um, third, I predicted Luke Greenback. Now, Luke is a guy who runs a 90 stroke rate all the way through. He's a higher stroke rate guy, and he's, he's splitting 29.2, 29.2, 29.3. Um, by the way, Ryloff in the semis is 29 flat, 29.1, 29.1, flat. There you go again. You know, all three of those last 350s right smack on the nose. And Ryan let off this third 50 a little bit, went 29.7, otherwise he was 29 flat. So Ryan can't do that in the finals. He's got to be probably a little ahead or even with, with Ryloff. He's got to hold him on the third 50 and then hope he can get home faster. It's going to be a great race. We'll see what happens. But uh, if Merce wins a race of his life, he could potentially, and I think uh, will win the gold medal. But that may take a 152 high or 153 low. Uh, the men's 200 IM. Oh, women's 100 free. I missed that one. Women's, women's 100 free. Can't forget this one. Um, it's, it's tight in there. I think that the two people to watch, in my opinion, uh, are Emma and Chauvin. I, I, I think those two are, are the ones to beat in this race. As, as strong as Kate Campbell has been through her career, um, I just don't know if she's good enough at this point in her career to win this race. Uh, typically, she's not going to finish. All the Australians, by the way, breathe every fourth. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. That's what they do. There are some of the others that do as well. But um, I, I'm predicting that, uh, uh, that, that Emma's going to get her gold medal tonight in this one. Uh, I'd love to see her. She's a great girl. She's really a powerful stroke. Didn't have a good 800 free relay split last night. But I think she's going to go 52-2 and win this. Chauvin, second, 52-3. I think she can stay with her and hang with her, try to be with her. But I think in the end, uh, Emma's going to get to the wall first. And I predicted that Penny Alexiak, who's ha actually having a great Olympics and a great comeback for her, will sneak in there for the bronze medal at 52-6. Uh, maybe Kate will surprise me and, and, and have the race of her life. I hope, you know, she, she really was the best hunter freestyler in, in 2016 just didn't swim a smart race. And um, maybe tonight she does. So we'll see what happens there. And we got the men's uh, 200 IM. This one, uh, you know, you need to throw a dart at the board to see who's going to win this, because I don't really know. And I, to be honest with you, look at this. It's like one and a half seconds or less between first and eighth. And there's some big names in there. I mean, you've got Michael Andrew, who's the world's fastest guy for 150. Um, some people thought he let up in the, uh, the end of his prelim and, and semifinals in the free. I don't think he did. I think he just hurt him. Uh, I just don't think he can finish. So uh, I'd love to see Michael win. I don't think he will. I think uh, you're going to be surprised in my prediction here, but he's just having such an amazing meet. He's going to carry it through in this. That's Duncan Scott, even with not a very good breaststroke. I think he can come home and maybe watch in the last 10 meters. He might go from fifth to first uh, finishing. He's so fast at the end. Um, 
Second, I wasn't really sure, so I just, you know, I, I got the darts out and I threw one and it landed on Jeremy Duplange from Switzerland. This guy's pretty good and I like him. And I, you know, I predicted he's going to go a one, and by the way, I put 155.2, wins it uh, for Duncan Scott. Um, 155.8 I had down for Jeremy and I got Michael third at 155.9. Uh, I hope he proves me wrong. I'd love to see him. He's a great guy. He's, he trains right here, and he's, a, uh, you know, he's just a super nice kid. And if, if he's going to medal, this is the event he has to do it in. He has a chance to win. I just don't think he's got the finishing strength to be able to do it. love to see it happen, but um, we'll see if I'm right. Any one of these guys could win this race tonight. So it's going to be really an exciting uh, race. Uh, what else do we have, Thomas? We got uh, 100 butterfly. Ah, uh, yes, the heats, the 100 fly. This morning, Caleb went 50.3. I did not get to see these races, unfortunately, because uh, I was coaching. Um, but this, I think, is really going to boil down to a race between Caleb and Kristoff. Maybe one of the most exciting races of the Olympics. And um, you know, I just don't see anybody having the speed or the ability to um, to stay with those two guys. Uh, it's going to be, you know, a little bit of the same story that we see with Caleb and Kyle. It's going to be, can, um, you know, can, can Milov come back or Milov come back and beat him in the end? Because I think um, Caleb is, is, is great at getting out. He's way ahead on the dive. Uh, but it's, it's the next 35 meters where he has trouble. He finishes so well. But if Milov's going to get him, it's going to be, probably in those 35 meters before they get to the flags. Because if, you know, Caleb puts his head down for eight strokes in the wall without a breath, hard to beat him with the stroke rate that he gets to. And like in his freestyle, getting to 125 stroke rate on the last 13 strokes without a breath is crazy. I mean, that's unbelievable, long course meters. Short course 100, yeah, that's what he does, but not long course. Anyway, here you see him at the trials where he went, uh, what did he go, 50.1 or so? At that, or, or right, or was it 49? He, I think he was. I think he was over 50. He, he was right around 50 there. But uh, whoever's going to win this is going to go under 50 for sure. Uh, be a, it'll be a great race. Uh, we've got the 200 backstroke for women. Uh, look at the look at the heat results in this. This is, you know, an indic indication of how strong the world has gotten because you see a difference of less than a second between first and eighth. And, you know, this is another dartboard uh, opportunity to throw up. You have to go with Kaylee McCown right now just because she's so hot. She's swimming so well. Uh, she's having a great meet. But I like Ryan White's chances. I think Ryan White can drop. Uh, Kylie Moss is going to be great. I think it's those three. But Phoebe Bacon had also an excellent swim in the heats at 203. Uh, what is it going to take to win this? I mean, they're going to go faster. They're all going to go faster. We'll know more about this in the semifinals. But I think right now, I would probably put um, Kaylee and and and, uh, and, and Kylie, uh, and and also uh, uh, Ryan as as the three top favorites. You know, I don't know how Phoebe's going to do. She's young. She might drop down. But I would I would put those three probably ahead of everybody else. Uh, we'll see what happens there. And um, we had the women's 800 free uh, heats. Again, look how tight this one is. You've got five seconds separating first through eighth. Um, can Katie hang on here? Uh, first of all, Katie Grimes, the other Katie from the U.S., 817 in prelims. She was in lane eight at the Olympic trials, barely got in there. And I don't remember what she went there, but it wasn't that fast. She's already gone faster than she did at trials. And this girl loves to come home. Uh, could this be another upset by one of our own, Katie Grimes beating Katie Ledecky? She has the potential to possibly do that. Um, Simona Quadrello, who's a fast stroke rate, that's a t Italy, fast stroke rate, 100 plus stroke rate, 817 right behind. Sarah Kohler from Germany, 8, 817 right behind. All of them, they're all bunched up in there. Um, I'd like to say Katie's gonna pull it off again because she's gonna go out for it, try to take the lead and hang on and see if anybody can catch her. Uh, but there's several swimmers in this race that has a, have a chance to do that. And so we'll see how she does, but it'll be a great race as well. You wanna talk about the four, four by one mixed medley? 
Yeah, we have a mixed medley, and, I'll, and then we'll take some questions because I've been talking an awful lot, but this mixed medley is interesting because we have Britain who qualified at 338.75. Uh, Britain just looks awfully tough to beat on the medley relay, whether it's all men or, or the mixed relay. I think they're certainly uh, going to be the team to beat. Can the U.S. Uh, or even China or Australia challenge them or Italy? I, I, I doubt it. I just don't think they have the horsepower or the manpower or the woman power to do it. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting race for second, but I think Great Britain's. And I think Petey's played, what, 57 flat this morning. Um, James Guy, 50.5 on the fly. That's not a good sign for the United States, uh, knowing that Petey, they're going to give up at least a second and a second and a half to Petey in the breaststroke, maybe more, uh, depending on how crazy he goes on the medley relay. But uh, uh, I think you know, Britain is going to win this uh, mixed medley relay. Hopefully the United States gets second, and I think Australia might step up. Uh, although, you know, it's, it's funny, after that inner free relay last night, I just never know with them how they're going to do. Sometimes they're hot and cold, and uh, overall they've had a great Olympics, but they haven't been consistent through every event. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get some questions here. Um, it has surprised me that Fink came home in 26-2 in the final 50. You know, I, I didn't know him well enough to know if he would be able to do that. And he came off the wall, and I, I, I was screaming and everything. And I said, I, I think he can do it. Because I saw he came off with this ferocious kick with his hybrid freestyle. He stepped his stroke rate up to, um, like, over 100. He's an 86-stroke rate guy all the way through. But he comes home in, like, an 100-stroke rate hybrid. And, and he just was charging. And, and, you know, the other three guys... I mean, Paul Trenieri's just really got one speed, and, and I knew that if it came down to, and I, I want to give him credit because at about, I don't think, it, uh, 600 or so, everybody thought that Welbrock and, and um, uh, uh, Romanchuk were going to pass him, but he just kept fighting, and he, he wouldn't let those guys pass him. And he's like at a 96-plus stroke rate all the way through. But his last 50 was the same as all the other ones. I and mean, he was like 28 low or something like that. But uh, no, I didn't expect, I didn't know Bobby. I just know he's tough. Um, uh, and, uh, everything I've heard about the guy, he's a class act. I know he trains extremely hard, swimming family. Um, I, I thought, gosh, if anybody, and it's rare to have a guy come, be able to come back like that. But if anybody I thought it could do it, he did it. And he did, and he, and he earned and won that gold medal. It was a, a great swim for him, great swim for the United States. Um, do I think uh, Fink could have gone 144 in the 200? Um, you know, I don't know what he did short course. It's a, it's a good question. But I don't think he swam the 200 at trials. I don't believe. And, and it's just not his event. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean he finished in 54-9. Um, on the last hundred of an 800, makes you wonder if he couldn't go that you know 144. But I, I don't know the answer. He, I, he's not as fast as some of the other guys. Like even Kieran Smith is much faster 200 yards than Bobby Fink. But I, that's a good question. He might have, but don't second guess that relay. Give the coaches and give give Zach a, a, a break because you know you just you can't do it every time. He had a he had a rough day, again, but you know cost him a medal. So what? It's okay. You know, we've had, we're having a great Olympics, so we're going to keep it going. Um, will I be covering the 10K open water? Um, Paul Trenieri is one of the favorites in there. I, I, I'm going to watch that race. The reason is one of my race clubbers from way back is in that race, not swimming for the United States, but swimming for uh, Britain, and that's Hector um, uh, Pardo, Pardo, Hector Pardo, who's, who came – to the race club when he was like eight or nine years old. And I mean, I saw him one time, and I'm taking zero credit for this guy's success, zero. But his brother was there, and his brother was the guy we were focusing on at the time. And Hector was just kind of a hang-along guy who would just, you know, go into the pool with his older brother, Alfie. And I was coaching Alfie, and his dad was there. And, you know, he never came back. Well, he did come back once, I think, but I didn't ever get to coach um, Hector again. But I followed his career, and he's, be he's become one of the leading uh, uh, favorites in the 10K open water. So, um, and I, you know, I'm always interested in that race. It's a fabulous race to watch, and it's a 
a real strategy race. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, what are my thoughts on the 18-year-old Tunisian guy who won the 4 free? Just swam the race of his life at the right time. And, and the Olympics is about racing, you know, even though time-wise, you know, you can go back 20 years and guys swam that. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to remember times. No one really remembers records, but they remember whether you won a gold medal for the rest of your life. And that guy will be the hero in Tunisia forever. Luis Maluli is a hero in Tunisia uh, and, and will be forever. And they're not going to get a lot of gold medals, I don't think, from that country. So uh, for him to do that was just a superb, great. That's the, that's the kind of Cinderella story that the Olympics are made of. And that, that's what makes, it, to me, the Olympics so, so fun to watch. Because you never know when a guy like Hafnau is going to come up, never heard of him, and win. And that just was, was uh, an incredible thing. Um, what about Paul Trenier with the mono he discovered in early June? You know, I don't too, know too much about that, but if that's the case, uh, then it's uh, unbelievable what he's done. I, I want to just say Sarah Schostrom, to be as competitive as she had with a broken elbow back in, I think it was February or March, she slips on the ice, breaks her elbows in a cast for a month. And she, here she is going, and she's in the finals, isn't she, Tony? She's 52-8, I think. She's in the finals tonight, but... How do you do that? That's mental toughness. And if Paul Trenieri had mono in, in June of this year, and he's doing what he's doing now, that guy is mentally tough. And, and he is. We know that because that's the way he swims. And, and, and just uh, a great comeback from that. So my hat's off to him. Um, any other questions we got? Um, we have Jordan's dad who's asking uh, why Chalmers can uh, close in on Dressel in the last 10 meters with a slower stroke rate. Well, first of all, um, he didn't close in on, on, on uh, Chalmers did not close in on Dressel in the last 10 meters. Chalmers closed in on Dressel in the 30, uh, 40, 35 meters or probably 38 meters from the wall to 13 meters out. And if you look at that race and you see uh, Caleb at the, at the 15 meter mark, he didn't wait to 13 meters like he did in Korea in the World Championships. 15 meter mark, he goes into the 125 stroke rate. Now he takes one or two breaths in there and then he puts the head down. 13 strokes, I counted him, into the wall, no breath at 125 stroke rate. Chalmers was probably not losing any ground at that point. They were like dead even. And he wasn't gaining on, he wasn't gaining on, on, on Caleb. So Caleb loses the race if he doesn't do that. Chalmers, in, in, in his own air, I think, if he had done the similar thing, if he had just, you know, kept the, the 105 stroke rate, he doesn't. He slows down to a 98 stroke rate. Does his speed slow going into the wall? Hard to tell looking at it. It might. He definitely lifts his head at the finish. That could have cost him. Go back and look at the video. He, he lifts his head up, and he shouldn't have. Um, you, know, might, you might find five different ways he could have found six one hundredths of a second. But in the end, you know, you win by a hundredth of a second and you win the gold medal or silver if you don't. Um, and, and sadly, nobody, nobody remembers the differences in time between first and second place. Um, the good news is Kyle Chalmers won the gold medal, you know, five years ago in, in Rio. Uh, he didn't, it's hard to come back to back. Not many people have done it. Popov, um, I don't even know how many people back to back did. Did um, Peter Van and Hugenbach do that? And I think he might have, but there are very few that have been able to do that back-to-back -back victories. I think Peter did it in 2000 and 2004. Tough double to come back and win that. Um, could Kyle have won that race? Yeah, he probably could have changed a couple little things and done it, but he didn't. And Caleb did what he did, swam it differently than he did in career, and he wins. Um, can, can Titmus get to the podium in the 800 free? The way she swims never rule her out. And it's so bunched up in there, I wouldn't be surprised if she wins it. I mean, she's just having that kind of a meet. A little disappointed with her leadoff in the, in the 8-0 free relay. You know, I thought she should have been closer to her, you know, her, her race time. And if she would have, they would have done a lot better. They could have won that maybe. Uh, but we'll see what happens. She's such a racer, and she's having a hot meet. She's, she's you know, she's, she's feeling it. Um, the, the, the problem, I think, with her 800, one of the reasons she's not as good in that race is, is her breathing pattern, which she sticks 
And I, don't, I haven't actually watched her soon the 800. I'll, I'll see what she does tonight. But going with the 4-2 pattern, breathing pattern through 800, I think is, is not going to work. And I don't think she probably stays with it at some point. I would guess she goes to every cycle, but maybe not. We'll have to see. I have to go back and look at, at a raise. But I think the breathing catches up to her and her pH drops down. She just can't hold the sustain that speed. Um, should be a great race. Any other questions? Yeah, just one more question from Will, who's uh, Abby Wood is an uh, IMer from Great Britain, and he's, he's wondering about her, her down kick. I'm assuming in, in her breaststroke. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Um, I haven't. I will say this, and I'm, I'm not, I don't like to speak to these things publicly, but if you, if you look at Alex Walsh in the breaststroke and the 200 IM, she has a, a little down kick she does after the breaststroke kick, which is illegal. And I worry about that with Alex. And, and she didn't get called on it. Uh, it's very hard to see it from above water. Underwater cameras, you can usually see it. But there are very few of the breaststrokers at the elite level that do that because they know they can get uh, DQ'd for it. Uh, and if that's what you're referring to, I've not really paid attention to Abby Wood's breaststroke in the IM, if she's doing that or not. Um, but if she is, she's probably going to pay the price. Fortunately. Um, you don't want to see that happen at the Olympic Games um, because it's, it's just heartbreaking when somebody gets DQ'd at that level. But if they're doing it illegally, then it's illegal. I mean, we all, I, I shouldn't say we all, but many of us watched Cameron Vandenberg in the replay underwater in Rio, or in, in London rather, where he takes two dolphin kicks, uh, clearly takes two big dolphin kicks in the breaststroke on the pullout. And, um, gets away with it, you know, and, and a lot of people scream bloody murder, but can't go back and DQ him because it's on the video. Uh, it's, it's something they have to risk. If they do that, they, they should learn to do what Adam does, was lift the legs, point the toes, and hold that position. You can't come down after you come up. You can come up, and that's an important part of the rest of the kick, is that little up kick at the end uh, generate some propulsion. I mean, there's some, some propulsion out of that, and you see the speed come back up. I see that on the VMs all the time when they come up like that. And they can get a lot of propulsion, not a lot, but they can get some propulsion out of that. Um, and then pointing those toes avoids one of the horrible mistakes, technically a breaststroke, of letting the feet hang and causing a tremendous amount of drag. You just don't see that at the elite level, but I see it all the time in young breaststrokers, not lifting and pointing those toes. Um, I'd love to do a VM on, um, on Tatiana because she keeps it. Look, watch her tonight, how wide she goes on her pole, but how long she keeps that head down. And she really surges in her pole because of that. And I think all breaststrokers should do that. I think they should keep that head in water. It's kind of like a late breath butterfly technique that we teach. Keeping that head down longer is, is keeps the drag down. And, and you see that Luke Orlando uses that technique. Um, uh, What's his name? The guy that won the um, Joseph Schooling used that technique, keeping the chin down longer in the fly. You don't see a lot of people doing late breath fly, but you do see a few. Uh, Jack Conger is another guy that does that. Anyway, um, I think that's about all the time we got. Uh, we went a little way over time today, in fact, way over time. But there's a lot to talk about. Uh, enjoy the Olympics tonight. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, go Team USA. Thank you.